A new era is upon us, and Tangent is back with a new limited series hosted by venture capitalist Jeffrey Berman and me, PropTech entrepreneur Edward Cohen. Tangent unites PropTech founders, real estate investors, urban leaders, and passionate creators who are improving our cities and quality of life. Join us to learn how we can solve the present day challenges in our communities with innovative technology and greater collaboration. We'll examine diverse issues through interviews and conversations where going off on a tangent is encouraged, hoping to help you become a more nuanced thinker and find comfort in data. If you are working on a PropTech solution, a nonprofit, or a small business that makes our cities better and would like your mission featured on our features segment, please email us at tangentcommunity at gmail.com. Welcome to Tangent. I'm Edward Cohen. Today on Tangent, we have Kevin Ordner, president of Appreciate and CEO of its operating arm, Renters Warehouse, a leading end-to-end single-family rental marketplace and property management platform and the first in the industry to go public. Hi, Kevin. Where does this podcast find you? Hi. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I'm uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota today. Beautiful Minneapolis. I have not made it there yet, but um, I'm in uh, Brooklyn with the hipsters this morning. Great to have you on. Kevin, appreciate holdings. You guys are in over 40 markets across the U.S. Uh, You've been in the industry for more than a decade now. Uh, You're in a unique position to tell us what's the state of the single family aka the SFR market uh, going into 2023. So can you talk about some of the trends first and what do you expect to see uh, in the space? Hey, thanks again for having me. I think it's going to be an interesting year as we look forward to 2023 as we record this here in January. I think some uncertainty, but a lot of optimism in the single family rental housing space as we move into 2023. Uh, it's been an interesting six or seven months as there's been a lot of macro economic changes to the housing industry as a whole, and it's certainly affected the single family rental housing industry as well, and created a pause on how to build a portfolio moving forward from an investor's perspective. But I think what underpins everything as we move into 2023 is the fact that the fundamentals haven't changed, right? We are a nation in the United States that is severely undersupplied with housing for people. Depending on the report you look at, four, six million housing units short Homes are becoming increasingly unaffordable for people to be able to purchase and live in. And and that's the type of living environment that a lot of people want, is that home with the yard in a great school district, a great place to raise a family. And so all of those folks who have been being priced out of being able to buy that home right now, given current prices and mortgage rates, are increasingly turning and continue to turn to renting that same type of property. So that underpinning demand Uh, that's there for single family rentals. I think it's gonna continue to propel our industry in a very positive way in 2023. And in turn, the industry can do a very positive thing uh, for for communities across America and provide quality housing for those who want that single family type uh, lifestyle, but maybe can't afford it and can choose to rent it instead. Right, yeah, I mean, I think there's been a a shift as well in psychology from being forced to renting to, to choosing to rent uh, either to have more space to access uh, neighborhoods that they desire or just uh, simply having the flexibility, right? Not being tied up uh, to a high interest rate uh, mortgage. Yeah, I think that's been that's been a profound shift in the industry since I started more than a decade ago is when I got into this business prior to the 2008 housing downturn, being a renter, was almost a derogatory term, like, oh, you don't own a home, you're renting, right? Accelerate and fast forward to today, there's a lot of families and individuals out there who rent by choice. It's the lifestyle they want. They don't want to maybe live in a city long term. They're looking at being flexible and moving somewhere else. And so that absolutely is not only need-driven renters, again, those who maybe can't afford it but want to live in that lifestyle, but also choice-driven renters. And choice-driven has certainly been an increasing bucket over the last um, five or six, seven years uh, that we've been seeing. Um, So currently you have uh, over 12,000 single family rental investors that you're servicing. Uh, Can you talk a bit more about the different strategies between uh, the different investors that you have, retail and institutional investors? Yeah, so at Appreciate Renters Warehouse, we are um, an end-to-end service platform for single family rental investors of all sizes. So we help uh, investors with as few homes as one, 
uh, all the way up to institutional clients of ours who own thousands of homes across multiple markets. And our mission for both those client segments is really the same, which is to just make real estate investing easy and transparent. Uh, and so we have, as you mentioned, over 12,000 different investors across the country um, in a growing base of properties, over 15,000 homes across 40 markets. And we really got started with that retail investor, that mom and pop investor who maybe owns one or two homes and, and is really just trying to create long-term wealth and financial freedom for their family and making, again, accessing this type of investment um, easier, more transparent and, and create that financial security for them. And, and their investment strategy, that retail investor is different than what we read about today from the Wall Street investor or the, the larger hedge funds that are out there where it's a very long-term investment, 15, 20, 30 year investment. They're looking less at what is the property yield for me today. It's a little bit more of, can I make a little bit of money every month? What's the cash flow? Am I covering my payments? Can I save for repairs? And ultimately take advantage of all the great things that real estate has to offer or everyday ordinary Americans, which is the fact that you can leverage the asset to buy it, right? What I mean by that is is you can go in and put a smaller amount down on an investment. If you went into your banker today and said, hey, I'd like to take a loan out to buy some stocks in the stock market, they'd laugh at you. But you go to the same banker and say, I'd like to take a loan from you to buy this investment in real estate, they're going to give you 80%, right? And so being able to use bank leverage to buy an asset is something that ordinary Americans don't have access to for other investment classes, but here we do. And then having a, a tenant pay down that mortgage for you over the long term, Inf hedge yourself against inflation, generate some income, tax advantages, all of those types of things. So it's a very strategic long-term investment that you know our clients hope in 20 years when it comes to retirement, they've got their home paid off and they have a nice cash flowing vehicle or two uh, to assist them in retirement. So it's a very long-term strategy not as yield driven, uh, but creating great housing for people and setting themselves and their family up for generational wealth. That's the retail client side. On the institutional side, very similar, of course. It's about generating income um, and getting a return on investment. But of course, it's a lot more dialed into what's my yield return today? What's it going to look like in three to five years? How are we optimizing a portfolio over the long term? Those types of things, which is, again, very similar. Uh, but also just a little bit of a different macro strategy on, on how they're investing. And they're going to diversify over different regions and markets to make sure that, you know, they're not as hit by certain drivers in certain markets that are coming through and things like that. And that's where our business comes into play for them is the fact that with our larger institutional clients, we can help them across multiple markets, across investment strategies, um, and really be that single uh, partner for them in that versus having to leverage multiple partners across the United States. I think that's, I mean, super tremendous value that you provide because it doesn't matter if you're a retail mom and pop investor uh, or if you're an institutional, uh, replicating that formula, that property management formula across different jurisdictions, different geographies is something that's proven to be not trivial. Uh, and the fact that you, you know, you've been at it for, for so long uh, and you can provide a, a standardized you know, full stack service, I think, uh, is, is what all size, all investors of all sizes found uh, tremendously helpful. Now, uh, you didn't start like this, though. Uh, Appreciate has had a tremendous journey. You enter the space in and around uh, the great financial crisis of 09. I mean, talk about timing. But, you know, tell us the, the, the origin story. How did Appreciate get to uh, you know, oversee over 15,000 homes, be present in over 40 U.S. markets. How did that come to be? Yeah, so we got our start in uh, 2007. I joined the business in early 2008, and we were a local property management firm based here in Minneapolis, where I still am today. But we really wanted to approach the business differently, and that was apply technology to a space that had historically not had a lot of technology with it. Right. If you look at the real estate industry in general, it seemed like one of the last to be taking advantage of a lot of the technology that was coming out. And if you look at property management inside of real estate, uh, we were certainly the last part of the real estate industry to really get a lot of technology attention. And we thought there could be a better way. I found myself um, working with Renner's Warehouse, which is appreciates uh, operating business for our property management and um, uh, marketplace company because I was a real estate investor. I've been investing in single family rental properties for nearly 20 years. I used to be a corporate pilot, 
I was flying around the country trying to manage my properties myself and finding myself to, you know, I was forgetting that the rent was due, needed to collect that, forgot to dispatch a vendor and, and started looking for property management companies to help me. And there wasn't a way to stay connected on the go. Uh, and that's when I ran into the gentleman who was starting Renters Warehouse at the time. And I partnered with him to open our Phoenix location uh, and uh, really kind of help look at how do we change this industry? And so we started with a couple of locations. We later leveraged the franchise model to grow our brand nationally across the country and partnered with many great entrepreneurs across the United States uh, and ultimately built a franchise network of over 28 offices across the country. And then we, at that point, we were still doing strictly property management, helping people lease and manage their homes pretty much exclusively for the retail investor. So our average client had something like 1.2 homes, right? It was a, it was a much uh, small landlord type community that we were growing these, home, these um, portfolios across the United States with. In um, end of 2015, we took on uh, a private equity partner. At that point really shifted the strategy of our business away from a franchise model to a more corporate owned model. Uh, we began buying back many of our franchises and we did this specifically to address the in growing institutional demand that we saw across the country where the single family rental industry had become a little bit more institutionalized. It's still less than 3% ownership across the country, but a lot of homes were being bought by these institutions and they didn't have a partner that could really help service them across the United States. So that became a focus of ours. Fast forward to about 2019, we said, there's more to this puzzle. Right. And this goes to really how we want to help our retail clients as well is not only help them do a great job managing the homes that they have, but how can we help them select the right properties to be investing in for the long term and pick the right markets to be investing in. And so we acquired a business called Own America, which at the time was the second largest um, online marketplace for single family rental homes. Uh, that became the Renters Warehouse Investor Marketplace. And that was the beginning of our, our creating the end-to-end -end solution for single-family rental investors, where now we can help folks buy properties through our marketplace technology. We help with renovations and then, of course, leasing and property management. So full cycle uh, for SFR investors of all sizes. Um, and that's really what brings us uh, here today. Of course, we recently took the business public through our parent company, Appreciate, uh, through a SPAC merger uh, for about six weeks. I mean, what a, what an, what a fascinating journey. You had your literal 30,000 foot view as a pilot, and then you, you went, the, <laughs> you went the, the McDonald's model franchising, then you doubled down, you know, believing in what you, were, you had, but, you know, I'm sure to, to grow faster, you, you have to do it, you know, in-house, uh, and then, you know, just deploying full tech vertically integration to just service your clients and your end users. I think it's uh, truly remarkable. I mean, no wonder why uh, you uh, appreciate or yourself, you uh, were the fastest growing privately held company in America 10, 10 years in a row, 10 consecutive years in a row. We did, yes. Not the fastest, but we made the Inc. Uh, 500, 5,000 of one of the fastest uh, growing uh, privately held companies in America 10 years in a row, uh, which is quite a feat and uh, something we're really proud of. Remarkable achievement and, and something that I feel I find refreshingly honest in your website is that you you say uh, you're the second largest online marketplace out there. You know, everyone's claiming to be the best, the fastest, the number one, like not not everyone can be the number one, not everyone's the leading, you know, that's uh, refreshingly honest and uh, you know, it's still at the top. Um, but uh, let's talk about that, that uh, residential tech stack because you've been building, you know, parts of it, developing some in-house, other acquiring other ones. Uh, to, to grow exponentially. But let's talk about that transition from legacy to a vertically integrated tech platform. I mean, what, what technology are you uh, giving your investors, your property managers, your leasing agents uh, to improve operations, to improve uh, the business, improve their lives? What a great question and something we've been focused on for a really long time at Renner's Warehouse. It, and I talked a little bit about the marketplace technology that we purchased in 2019 and have since been building on and continuing to grow. And that's for acquisitions of single family rental homes. Your question is more specifically around operations. And I think that's the bigger part, right? And so we, uh, for many years of our history, operated on a legacy off the shelf property management system uh, to, be, to, to remain unnamed because it's not important. But what we found with all of them 
uh, really across the industry is they didn't provide the flexibility that we really wanted to create the right customer experience. The right customer experience for our homeowners and investors, as well as the right customer experience for our residents and our employees. And we found as we look to continue to grow and scale the business from a one market operation to many markets across the country, where we maybe they have maybe had to have different processes around eviction because of local laws, maybe different processes around you know other parts of the business, we found ourselves spending more time making our processes fit the technology than having the technology help us do things in the most efficient manner. Right, and that was a frustration we found ourselves running into it over and over again, and, and we made the decision to build our own platform. Um, and this was a big leap, uh, and a lot of investment, and a lot of time obviously had to go into it. We didn't take the decision lightly, but ultimately that's the direction we went. And so we've built a proprietary operating system uh, built on the top of uh, the Salesforce stack that allows uh, us to continually optimize our processes and deliver our customers a very seamless real-time experience. And, um, you know, it's it's gotten us to a point where I think we're meeting the expectations of where people are at today with technology, right? If you don't want to talk to someone about the issues inside your home as a resident, you want to make that request via mobile app or, or, or a resident portal online, you can do that, upload photos and describe the issues you're having and those types of things. And that's where, where people are at today, right? It shouldn't have to be all phone calls and emails and texts back and forth but a true uh, mobile online experience. And so we've made request management and interaction from our residents with us something that's on the forefront of our mind and, and much easier. And the same thing for our, our homeowners or our investors is how are they getting real-time information and how are they being kept up to date? That was, besides the operational inefficiencies we were finding with traditional software platforms, we also, I think one of the big gaps in this industry historically had been transparency with homeowners, right? Um, they weren't finding out about repairs that were being done on the home until well past the repair was done and they were getting their, at the time, their rent check in the mailbox, right, versus versus now being direct deposited, but at a statement that says, hey, oh, there was an issue this month, or, oh, I'm sorry, your, your tenant didn't pay this month. And so for us, it was how we do we provide real-time insights and information to our clients, um, keep people up to date, and, and make it really easy to use across the platform. So that all of those issues and, and more is what really set us off to build the stack that we have today, which, again, is really geared to making it an efficient business to operate. It has to be efficient. Scattered site, single family rental management across the country is is, mo is challenging enough. Let's have technology enable us, not hold us back. And then how do we create a, a great experience for residents and homeowners alike? Um, and that's what, you know, we've solved some of them, but we continue to iterate and evolve. And uh, we're going to continue to enhance the experience here as we as we continue to grow the business. Wonderful. I mean, and it's so so much easier said than done. And, and at the end of the day, it, it goes back to to the the human level, right? Streamlining communication, that transparency among stakeholders, that you know, also expectation of, of real time uh, information and and you know, constant communication, because you may have the the tailwinds in your favor for the asset to be performing for the property, the you know, but at the end of the day. That the investor, the property manager, the renter needs to be, uh, you know, needs to have the information at hand when they need to, uh, and and that's what the industry had been lacking for for a while. As economies around the world struggle to get back to winning ways, investors are flying to safety to weather volatile economies. Despite its flaws, the US has typically been associated with having stable real estate markets that grow in value in the long term. One of the main challenges foreign investors have always faced has been how to finance real estate investments in the US while living abroad. Lend AI is a tech-enhanced direct lender financing U.S. real estate investments for foreign investors through a streamlined, efficient, and transparent process. Lend AI's unique artificial intelligence and platform are transforming the way foreign investors access U.S. financing. Their team comprises industry experts and innovators ready to disrupt the lending process. Lend AI is on a mission to help investors worldwide reach their financial dreams through real estate investing. 
They allow investors to manage the entire process remotely and perform all underwriting in the investor's home country for a simple and superior process. Lend.ai is currently active across 17 U.S. states, including Florida, Texas, New York, Georgia, Ohio, and Michigan. To learn how you can get financing through Lend.ai and grow your U.S. real estate portfolio, please visit landing.lendai.us slash tangent. That's L-A-N-D-I-N-G dot L-E-N-D-A-I dot U-S slash tangent. Let's talk about, uh, you know, zooming into to the tech stack, but more from the data side. There's so much data that we've, you know, it's always been there and now we're starting to track it. Now we're starting to measure it. Now we're starting to apply it to decisions. So talk about some of your, your novel data sources, either uh, the ones that you're using to help with uh, property acquisitions or the ones that you're using to determine your rental estimates. Uh, or how are you valuing your asset, your portfolio at large, and, and what data sources are helping you? It's amazing how much data exists for residential real estate or real estate in general out there. But as you, as you continue to go in closer and closer to our industry, um, how fragmented the data is around single family rental properties and, and how it's very lacking. And I think part of the reason for that is this hasn't been an institutional asset class before, right? And still today, it's single family rentals across the United States, 97% of them are owned by smaller investors. In fact, 90% of all the single family rental homes across the country are owned by those who own five homes or fewer, right? So it's very fragmented. So that information is not being shared. And it's a little different than the home ownership world when a house sells, you know, that sale is recorded at the, at the public registrar, it's public information we can understand as real estate investors or home shoppers or Zillow data, what did that home actually sell for? So we have a real comp. When you look at lease data, though, you know, a lease isn't recorded. We don't actually know what the home rented for unless it's a data partner of, of one of the data aggregators or data providers. That makes it very challenging. We know what it listed for. We know what the list rent was and how long it was on the market, but what did it actually settle for from a contracted rate? And so that's where we've found a lot of value in our rental data is we not only manage homes for larger institutions, but also these smaller mom and pop landlords that historically and, and traditionally don't report what their rent data is, right? And so being able to capture a lot of different types of true lease data on small portfolios across the country in different markets, um, understanding the type of home, the quality of the home it was that was at lease, that's tremendous data, in fact, we don't leverage it as nearly as much as we should. We continue to think about how can we leverage this type of information more and more. And of course, having access to that type of lease data really allows us to accurately underwrite homes that we purchase for our customers. So rather than just using third-party data or assumptions on what this house in this neighborhood might rent for given this condition level, we may have some real comps in that market around that area. And, and, and on top of it, the way we've built our business is we like to leverage that data, but we also understand real estate is local and we have local individuals that work exclusively for our business in those markets who are vetting this data and decisions on a daily basis and continues to hopefully improve the way that we underwrite and look at these homes. So that's one way that we're leveraging, we think our unique data set. The other is operational expenses are of course very important as you look at how are these assets going to perform over time and there's only so many things that levers you can pull um, from that from those expenses that aren't fixed like property taxes there's not a lot we can do with we can of course appeal them but ultimately you know somewhat uncontrollable insurance rates the same thing but repair and maintenance expense how is that varying by market how do we continue to grow our maintenance network and create relationships that we can reduce maintenance costs so of course we're looking at preventative things all the time, looking at the data, but also then underwriting homes again, going back to the purchase of the property initially, using real data in those markets to say, okay, this is our historical run rate for expenses of uh, on an average four homes in this market. We can use those assumptions versus, you know, made up assumptions for what we think it's actually going to be. So we have a really unique data set given the breadth of our portfolio uh, and the different markets we operate in, we can use those to compare how one market might perform over another, or 
um, just be able to really tightly underwrite a home and how that performance is going to be moving forward. So interesting. And yeah, I mean, what word on the street is that uh, home prices won't be appreciating as much as they have in, in recent years going forward. So there's a, a newfound focus on on improving the bottom line. Right. And that goes directly to to cutting costs or making operations more efficient. And yeah, but, uh, you know, I want to I want to hone in uh, on the on the acquisition part, because, as you said, on underwriting homes. Uh, accurately is is half of the equation. If, if an investor overpays or if you estimate the wrong rent, then that asset won't perform e- regardless of, of the market conditions. So um, yeah, and, and another, uh, I think something that's been real, you know, that the industry has noticed is that uh, appraisers uh, rely a lot on listing price. May that be listing price of, of what uh, an asset is a uh, home they're they're trying to sell or, or listing price for what they're trying to rent which doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end price that the home is going to end up trading for. Um, so my, my team at Cape Analytics would kill me if I didn't ask, but um, are you, you know, in terms of when you value homes, how much does property condition come into play? Are, are you using, uh, you know, the, how do you determine the quality of the home? Condition is really important, but it's a big challenge to really understand the property condition, right? And so... When we are underwriting homes, there's a couple, of course, very important pieces to that. Like, what's the home worth? It doesn't matter what it's listed for, and it doesn't often matter what the comps are that's sold down the road because condition is so important. And that's been something that we've been trying to improve and add more automation to. And frankly, we're probably not leveraging enough, so we should talk more about uh, your, your technology at Cape Analytics. But um, we are assessing the property based on the photos that are provided in the MLS listing, information gathered from listing agents, trying to apply as much automation to, of course, that that photo piece as you can. But then frankly, we are putting eyes on every property before contract close uh, or before inspection period ends. So we have human beings going into each one of these homes after a contract's accepted to understand, did we assume the renovation properly? Right. As we're underwriting a home, we have to assume what type of renovation is needed. What's the condition of the home? What, how are the utilities? What are we going to have to upgrade? Uh, and our process and our platform and our systems become fairly accurate at that. But then getting a final check on what that really looks like and bringing in and honing that bid is, is, is really important. So that's a big part of our process and something that as we look towards the next 6, 12, 18 months that we are excited to add further automation um, and artificial intelligence too. Fascinating. Um, let's move on uh, to you becoming a publicly traded company. I mean, super exciting for the industry. The first one uh, doing what you're doing, managing single family rentals, uh, going public, and with probably the most accurate and best ticker of all time with SFR, single family rentals. Uh, so, I mean, I'm sure the audience will have a ton of questions around this, but. Uh, you know, in terms of, of the timing uh, for going public, uh, you know, what's your strategy there? Uh, what are you hoping to achieve by, by following a SPAC uh, route? route? Um, and, and what are you going to do with the money? Yeah, look, for us, it was the time in our business was right. We have created a fantastic foundation for this business, whether it be our operating network across the country and the, and the scope of which we've grown the business today, the technology foundation that we've built and our people across the country. And we know through history that where we invest in the business and and whether that's marketing a customer acquisition for more individual retail landlord customers to technology development and innovation for our institutional partners, that we can grow. Uh, We know where to invest in the business to create good returns. And it was about access to capital. For us, right? We've been um, a private business, of course, since inception. We've had private equity capital partners, uh, and this was an or- a next, uh, a natural next step for us. And we think we're in a place to really be able to capitalize on the industry moving forward. It's a challenging time in the financial markets right now, with uh, you know, as we sit here today and record with the stock markets and everything that's been going on. And so we get a little bit of a, you know, why now? Uh, but we believe, you know, continuing our history of being a first mover in the space is important. We think this adds a lot of uh, credibility to our business for institutional partners. We've obviously, we're a very highly vetted business now at this point. 
and the access to public market capital, being able to raise money or do great mergers and acquisition deals and, and things like that. There's a lot of exciting things that um, are in our future that come from our public listing. And so the time was right for us as a business. Capital markets aside, this was, um, this was the right time for us to be able to do that. We have great places we can invest in our business and customer acquisition and technology development that's really going to propel us into the future. And we believe we're, we're really set up to be able to do that. I like that. I mean, you're, you're zagging when everyone's zigging. And I think, uh, you know, it shows that, you know, you have a lot of confidence in your business and I'm sure your, your renters and your investors uh, will certainly appreciate that as well as your employees. Now, th- let's move on to uh, the next topic, which is the, the housing supply and affordability crisis. Uh, as you pointed out, by, by some estimates, there's a shortage of between three to six million homes in the U.S. Um, I mean, wh- what's going on here? Is there, is there more to it than just a massive imbalance between supply of homes and, and demand for homes? Uh, that's, uh, that's, a bi- that's a big question. I think it's really interesting because we need more housing in the United States. Right. Uh, we talked about it at the top of the podcast. You just mentioned the stats. We're also in a really interesting economic environment in the United States right now with inflation and the Fed trying to, you know, slow down or stive off that inflation by increasing interest rates, which is discouraging builders and developers from going out and building homes because who's going to buy them uh, and who's going to who can afford them at six or seven percent mortgage rates. And so we're actually making the problem worse right now from a macroeconomic policy perspective, uh, which frankly, unfortunately bodes well for single family rental because of all the reasons we talked about earlier and and how affordability and housing shortages can be good for rental investors. Um, But it's challenging for, you know, American communities as a whole. And and, and that problem is getting worse. I think there was a, there was a housing shortage before the great financial crisis in 2008 and the housing downturn then, but it was exacerbated in a big way then because builders pulled back so far and for, for good reason and all that kind of stuff. And we never returned even to really pre-great financial prices building levels. It's going to take a long time to solve. It's probably going to take, you know, changing national policy to solve. But ultimately, I think what we can do as service providers in the space and what we can do with our investors that we work with is, you know, do our best to solve the problems we can locally. Uh, This is obviously a national problem, but how do we help our communities locally do this? How do we help our investors bring affordable housing to their market, their individual market? I think that's the amazing thing about even the smaller, what we call retail mom and pop real estate investor, and we don't mean that term in a negative way at all. That's just kind of what it is, and that's what they've been termed. I have tremendous respect for them. I'm a retail mom and pop investor, right? I've been investing in single family rental properties for 20 years, and I have tremendous respect for people out there risking their time and their capital to, of course, make a return for themselves financially and create, again, what I always call long-term wealth and financial freedom for their families, generational wealth. But they're also improving communities. Many of these investors who turn into, you know, we're not talking just the house flippers we see on TV or wholesalers that we talk about in the industry, but people who are creating single family rental properties, a lot of times they're taking a home that needs major repair and renovation, investing that capital, risking their capital for the hopes of being able to turn around and rent it to a great family and and create a great place to live. And that's who's improving communities. And that's another way of addressing this housing shortage is taking homes that frankly are nearly unlivable and revitalizing them and revitalizing communities and investing into communities. And I think that should be respected. That should be be more of the headlines. And what we're seeing in many communities across the country is cities coming in and, and pushing back against investors and saying, we don't want investors here. We're going to make it more challenging and more permits and more fees. And that's the opposite way that you improve your community. You need investment in community. You need people to come in and invest. And a lot of the homes that are being bought by smaller investors are properties that wouldn't be purchased with an FHA loan today because it wouldn't qualify. It doesn't have, you know, it needs too much work. Or even if it does qualify for that mortgage, the person that would buy it probably doesn't have the thirty, forty, fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollars to put in the home to improve it after they purchase the property, right? So these are people who are needed. These are people who are doing a great service to communities, and they're addressing the housing shortage 
and I think we need to remember that, and we should be focusing on them versus trying to make a villain maybe out of the big bad Wall Street folks who are who are coming in and buying a fraction of the homes that are for sale. Right. I mean, without justifying anything or anyone, I mean, the, the wild thing is that if, if we hadn't overbuilt before 2008, I mean, we would be in a arguably, not arguably, we would be in an even worse situation from a housing, you know, a supply accessibility uh, crisis. Now, uh, yeah, in, in two, two ways, which I think uh, only the SFR industry can fundamentally help solve the crisis is, is one, how you, what you pointed out, rehabilitating old homes or buying up assets that uh, other you know, end users or uh, mom and pop would not be able to on, on their own and rehabilitating those, bringing those units to market. But I think also BFR, right, uh, build for rent, uh, you know, in terms of what's going on with the capital markets in the e economy. Uh, only only larger investors or, or players with more experience are able to uh, bring uh, massive amounts of, of supply, new supply to market uh, to provide new housing and, and ease the, the rent burden uh, in that way. So I think in the next few years, uh, and the only way to bring that about is, is to work together with, with local governments, right? And but I, I don't see a national policy or even if there's a push, I mean, at the end of the day, real estate ends up being local because, as you pointed out, there's so many differences across states, across geographies. Um, so I think whatever the government can do to help bring about this, uh, you know, new, new communities of, of homes in partner with the big uh, SFR companies, I think, will be a win for everyone. Kevin, you're a published writer with the Rent the State Revolution. Uh, where you argue that the new American dream is is owning a single family is only single family rentals, how can we see? Like, do you think that's still achievable uh, for people uh, these days? Yes, I do. Um, and I, I I got talked a little bit about this on the previous question and my tangent about why I respect real estate investors so much because of the great they're doing great things they're doing in their communities. But the reason I I call it the new American dream is you know, a little bit of a play on the American dream of owning your home with the white picket fence and the two cars in the garage and, you know, 2.6 kids and whatever that might be. I think it's true. People want to own real estate. I think owning real estate is a way to create wealth long term for you. But we also talked about the fact that there's changing attitudes on renting homes. There's more folks who are renting by choice and lifestyle than just because they have to. Um, we have people who rent homes from us, or we've seen this in the past, folks who rent properties from us, our residents with us, actually own investment property, right? So they own real estate, but they're a renter today by choice for their primary residence, but they see the advantage of owning residential real estate or real estate in the long term. And so it's a little bit of play on that, but it's also, look, our world has changed over the last several decades around how people prepare themselves for retirement and how we create long-term wealth generational wealth for our families. You know, pensions up through the 80s was the way most people retired. They got a job, they worked hard, they did great for their community, their team and their employer. And when they when they hit a certain age or a certain number of years with the company, they retired, they had a pension um, and they did their thing. That's gone for the most part, unless you are, you know, work for, there's government jobs that of course still have pensions and there's, there's other, there's a few of them out there, but most of the time across the spectrum, saving and planning for retirement has become a very individual thing. The individual 401ks, the, the individual decisions you make. And, and I write in my book, I think, a compelling argument to why real estate should be part of everyone's retirement portfolio. All right? And again, we talked about it a little bit earlier in the podcast as well. But the, the fact that everyday ordinary Americans can leverage so many different things and all the power of owning real estate over the long term. This isn't a get rich quick scheme. This is a, I like to say it's get rich slow scheme because it takes methodical action to get started and continue. And it's not exciting because it's not like you turn around next year and say, oh my gosh, look at all the money I made. But in 15 years and 20 years after you've had someone paying down your mortgage and taking advantage of the tax benefits and increasing rents and, and all the things that go with it, we could do a whole show just on that. That's why I wrote the book. And to your question of, do I think it's still possible? Absolutely. Right, I get that question a lot. Should I buy a house in today's market as a rental property? And obviously I'm biased, but um, look, interest rates were six, 
when I started investing in real estate. Now, pr- home prices were different, but rents are also up tremendously. And so if the deal pencils, sure, right? Are there as many deals to be had that are easy to find today? No, uh, but there's plenty of deals out there. And if you're going to hold a property for five years, 10 years, 15, in my opinion, 15, 20, 25 years for retirement to create that long-term nest egg, it doesn't matter if the price goes down a little bit over the next couple of years. In 20 years, I can almost promise you with 100% certainty, I don't think they'll let me say for sure, right? But in 20 years, it's going to be worth more than it is today. And I can also assure you that if you don't refinance it, your loan, your mortgage on the home is going to be less than what it was today. So you have more equity, right? And so if you're a long-term thinker, find the deals that work in pencil today. They're going to look great in 20 years, 15 years, 10 years. Um, and so absolutely, I think that works. I, I really think this should be a part of everyone's financial plan uh, moving forward. It's just such a tremendous um, vehicle to create long-term wealth. SFR, the way to regain the lost American dream of retirement security. And uh, you can find the link to uh, Kevin's Rent the State Revolution in the episode description. Um, Kevin, uh, let's talk a bit about the, the future of cities, uh, the future of your city, uh, the Twin Cities. Uh, what's one aspect of your city that you wish other cities would adopt? What a great question. Look, I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. For better or worse, we have all four seasons, right? Um, and uh, right now it is absolutely winter. We had 16 inches of snow in the last two days uh, here in January of 2023. But our city is known for the great outdoors uh, and health and wellness. We consistently rank at the top of healthiest cities to live. We've got great medical systems and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. But I think the biggest part is the city's been created to be outdoors. And maybe not so much in the winter, although there's a lot of people who are out using everything that our city has to offer in the winter. But in the spring, summer, fall, great network of trails, walking trails, hiking trails, but really coupled with, you know, some natural outdoors. And I think our city's done a great job of preserving um, what makes our, our state unique of, of our great forests and lakes and, and, and network of, of all that kind of great stuff and, and integrating living with that and creating great hiking trails and all that kind of stuff. So I love being out in the summer. I love the access to walking trails, hiking trails, all the lakes and all the great recreation we have here. And I think there's other cities who have done it, done it also, but I absolutely love that about Minneapolis and the Twin Cities area. And uh, hopefully others continue to adopt that type of integration with, with uh, the great things that, that you know, another city might have to offer. Absolutely. We, we better be sending some uh, city planners around the world to, to Minneapolis to, to study how the great outdoors uh, can be integrated into cities. That's right. Kevin, let's enter the discomfort zone for a bit. Uh, what's something that you've changed your mind about recently? What's a perspective that you've uh, updated and why? I don't know how recently you want, but this is certainly recent and COVID plays a role in, in how timelines move in our head. And this has been a shifting perspective and I'm still kind of fully getting my arms around new perspective. But to be honest with you, for being a young guy, uh, my view on remote work and hybrid work has changed tremendously recently. Um, I was absolutely a loved people in the office all the time kind of guy. I'm a big believer in collaboration, um, not micromanagement, not for those reasons, but having people together, creating strategy and solving problems and doing those kind of things. And when COVID hit uh, in 2020, I absolutely hated sending everyone home, becoming a remote company. Now, fortunately, we were in a great position because of our technology to do so almost overnight. Uh, but it was tough. And I said, great, we're going to do this for two weeks. And we're going to come back. And of course, that became 30 days and that became three months. And that became we're still a very much remote and hybrid company today. And um, my viewpoints have changed on that tremendously. Uh, had you interviewed me two years ago, I would have said, yeah, we want to absolutely have people in the office. I, I'm a big believer in that. I still am. But with that's evolved to how do we create a hybrid uh, environment and workforce and utilize technology to achieve the same goal. And so now as we've um, kind of are, I don't know if we can say we're coming out of COVID or not um, anymore and, and when that might actually happen, but as we get to the new normal and we're evolving our, our uh, workplace, for us it's a hybrid look of how do we get teams to come together in person frequently, uh, but also allow the flexibility that people have come to want and, and, and enjoy uh, of, of the remote work 
as well. And so we're spending a lot of time studying that, looking at that. How do we do the best for our business and the best for our customers, but also be able to attract and retain the best talent and create great work-life balance, which everyone's looking for. Um, and so that's been a really big shift uh, in my mindset as a leader over the last couple of years, uh, for sure, and, and something that's that's still evolving. Absolutely. I mean, I'm sure it's been super humbling for, for leaders, uh, you know, during this period. And at the end of the day, uh, work-life balance, I don't know if there's such a thing anymore. It's more of a work-life integration. But yeah. Kevin, last but not least, where can uh, our listeners learn more about Appreciate, learn more about Renters Warehouse and the great work you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So um, our public company, uh, Appreciate, you can learn more information, find our investor resources page at appreciate.rent. Our operating business, Renters Warehouse, our property management, property acquisition company, renterswarehouse.com is a great place uh, to go there. And uh, people can connect with me and find me on LinkedIn. Kevin Ordner, president of Appreciate and CEO of Renters Warehouse, the first in the industry to go public. Kevin, thank you for coming uh, to Tangent today and appreciate everything you're doing uh, for renters, for investors, and uh, for our communities. Thanks for having me, Edward. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review Tangent and share this episode with a friend. This season is edited by Katarina Silva and is produced by me, Edward Cohen. Thanks for listening to Tangent and remember, collaboration is our superpower, so stay curious and always be learning.